morning. Good morning. Welcome in from the cold. Not only the, the warmth of the building helps us inside, but the warmth of God's love for us in Christ Jesus. And so it really warms our hearts, and we pray today would especially warm the hearts of people not only here, not only in our country, but around the world. As we conclude our series on um, being our witnesses following Jesus' uh, direction in Acts 1 8, and our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and today to the ends of the earth. And so I want to invite you to just reflect on your part in that mission as God's people in this particular time uh, that God gives us the work in His kingdom. A warm welcome to all of you, both members and guests. We're glad to have you with us today. And pray that you're encouraged and blessed as we celebrate our love and life and love the Lord. Uh, all that you need for your um, uh, worship today is in your worship guide. And we do encourage you to use the shepherding sheets that are in the back. We'll be uh, uh, greatly appreciated if you'll let us know uh, again that you're here for worship as we uh, celebrate our, our love and life together here at St. John's. Just a <clears throat> couple of announcements for us today. Um, as we concluded, uh, uh, our Lutheran Schools Week, there are some scholarship extra envelopes in the back. Uh, if you'd like to contribute to that class, the Valentine's Day, uh, that will be next weekend. That weekend is an opportunity to bring your mites, uh, your LWML mites, to, um, uh, to be shared with our, our uh, LWML so that, uh, again, mission might go on here and around the world. We'll also be um, a week from this Wednesday, uh, starting our Lenten series with that Wednesday worship, and that service will be at 6 o'clock uh, in the evening. Well, let's um, uh, then lift our hearts and voices to our God in praise and gather in his name as we, uh, as we encourage each other to continue to tell the story of God's good and gracious love to our opening hymn. I love to tell the story. <laughs>
each other in our worship today. We're gathered today into the name in which we've been baptized, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we have redemption through Jesus' blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. We are embraced by God's grace. And yet we all have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. We are equipped by God's gifts. Jesus said, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. We are engaged to in God's name. We have been given the grace won by Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And we've been given many spiritual and physical gifts by our Heavenly Father to go in the Spirit's power uh, to serve both our Lord and our neighbor. Let's now humbly come to our God. And with repentant hearts, ask for his forgiveness for the lack of faithfulness in always using the gifts he's given to us, we pray. I confess to you that I have not been faithful in unconditionally loving and accepting others, as you have embraced me by your grace and accepted me. I have not fully developed the physical and spiritual gifts with which you have equipped me. I have hesitated at times to engage the world you have sent me to serve in the power of your spirit. Forgive me, wash away my sin for the sake of your son, Jesus. Renew me in the power of your spirit to follow you more faithfully. Amen. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, the Lord Jesus has given me this precious task the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace for you. It's in him that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. And so it is in his name and by his command that I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, you desire that your house be filled with faith-filled people, yet many to the ends of the earth have not effectively heard the good news of your grace. Bless our witness so that the lost might be found, and those who have wandered from your presence or rejected your word might be brought back into your kingdom of grace, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God,
chapter 3. It is a lesson that uh, clearly helps us understand that unlike so many of the gods of the Old Testament and early New Testament age who were local gods, they were gods for a nation or for a people or for a household, the Lord God that you and I worship meant his name to be worshipped in all the nations. And so uh, God sends Jonah out of the nation of Israel to Nineveh to witness. This is after he'd been swallowed by a, a big fish and God had changed his mind and uh, so Noah accepted the mission God gave him. And then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. This is the word of the Lord. What we carry to the nations is the good news about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, and Paul reiterates it to the Romans in these words. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on fleshly desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. For those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. It's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise as you prepare to hear the gospel lesson this day from Mark 13. This lesson is chosen because it's one of the other places where Jesus mentions the ends of the earth. And he says indeed that he will not return until the gospel has reached the ends of the earth. In his teaching with his disciples, this is during the Holy Week from Mark chapter 13. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, Well, tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign? that they're all about to be fulfilled. Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed, for such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines, these are the beginning of birth pains. You also must be on your guard. But you'll be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, 
You will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested or brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I invite you to be seated for a children's lesson. You all know um, John 3.16, right? God so loved the world. That's right. So our object today is the world, right? And, um, and as we think about the world, we uh, can ask this question. How much do you know about other places in our world? If I had kids here, I'd say, how many different countries have you been to? And some might have had vacations where they went uh, uh, someplace else. My own grandchildren um, normally go to Canada, at least the, the ones who are here. Canada, yeah, every summer because uh, uh, they have, uh, it would have been their great-grandfather's uh, place where he grew up, on a lake up there. Uh, it's a long drive. My not North Dakota is halfway, so, you know. <laughs> okay? Um, but most of us, um, you know, kind of live kind of locally. And, and the reality is, how much do you know about what's going on in other parts of the world, it, you know, based on our news? Not much. Because how much does our news tell you about what's gone on in South America yesterday? Or what happened in Southeast Asia? Or what happened in Africa. Um, even getting news about Europe is kind of tough, and, and we would find ourselves most uh, uh, alike to them. And, and yet there are places that uh, where the gospel is growing, and we have an opportunity to, to see the gospel throughout our world. Uh, in your bulletin, you have an insert about Haiti, and of course that's pretty close to the United States. Uganda, the other place mentioned, is on the other side, just about of the world, just uh, right at the equator. And, and today we're going to be thinking a little bit about how we get the gospel out beyond our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, which are all within the contiguous United States of America for us, to the ends of the earth, which is the rest of the world. And what is God calling us to do as we... Um, Go into that end of the world. Jesus gave us this promise in the gospel. He said the, the world is not going to end until the gospel is preached in all nations. And, and, and by that, he doesn't mean just every country. He means every people group that we're going to think a little bit about to that today. So let's ask God to be with us, uh, to inspire us, to be aware of what's going on in the world around us, and then to be a part of sending the gospel. Uh, to those other parts of our world, especially the people who don't know him yet. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank you for leaving heaven. Thank you for leaving heaven. And coming all the way to earth. And coming all the way to earth. So that you could share. So that you could share. The good news of your love. The good news of your love. In a language I can understand. In a language I can understand. Help me to be your mouth. Help me to be your mouth. To share your good news. To share your good news. Here and around the world. Here and around the world. Even to the ends of the earth. Even to the ends of the earth. Amen. Amen. Let's continue with our sermon.
and from our dear Lord and our Savior Jesus. Amen. The text of the lessons that we've already read, we've been focusing on this um, in this epiphany season, a season of light on the, the words uh, of Scripture, the words of our Jesus when he says, in the same way that your light shall shine before men, that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And he especially calls us to do that in our uh, Jerusalem, in our Judea, in our Samaria. And today we focus on being witnesses to the ends of the earth. And, and we're reminded as we kind of conclude this series that uh, we have the precious privilege, the precious privilege of being witnesses. But it's so easy to get off course. It's so easy to get off course. Consider this mission statement of a well-known university. To be plainly instructed and consider well that the main end of your life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ. This uh, university was founded in 1636, and in its uh, founding it employed uh, only Christian professors, it emphasized character formation of its students, and above all, it placed a strong emphasis on equipping ministers to uh, share the good news. In fact, uh, it only had two courses of study at its founding, and that was uh, uh, a divinity school, a preparation of ministers, and a law school, preparation of lawyers. Every diploma read Christo et Ecclesia around Veritas. Now, what those are are just Latin words. Veritas is the word for truth. Christo ec Ecclesia means for Christ and the church. A university stopped, founded to give honor and praise to, to Christ and equip people for serving in the church. Well, you've probably heard of this school. If you can see the symbol, it's got the word Harvard in it. That was Harvard University. It was about uh, 80 years after Harvard's, Harvard's founding that uh, there were a group of New England pastors who sensed that, uh, that Harvard had drifted too far from their liking. And concerned by the secularization at Harvard, they approached a wealthy uh, philanthropist who shared their concerns. And this man, Elihu Yale, financed their efforts in 1718, and they called their college Yale University. Yale, um, their motto was not just Veritas truth like Harvard's, but it was Lux et Veritas, which means light and truth. And serious students of theology and divinity, particularly in New, New England, regarded Hebrew is such an essential component to being able to be a good preacher and to be a good leader in the church that it was considered a classical language along with Greek and Latin, essential for the study of the Old Testament. And so the words in the middle of the, the Yale seal were Urim and Thummim. What are those? Well, they're two precious stones that were uh, embedded into the high priest's garments. And when, God want, when the high priest wanted to understand what God uh, was saying to them, he would sometimes use those precious stones as a way to discern what God's will was. That's what was on the Yale one. Well, today, Harvard's and Yale's legacy of academic excellence are still intact, but neither school resembles what, it's, what their founders envisioned. In fact, at the 350th anniversary celebration of Harvard, Stephen Muller, who was the former president of Johns Hopkins University and a former alumni, bluntly stated, the bad news is that the university has become godless. And Larry Summers, the former president of Harvard, confessed, things divine have never been central to my professional nor to my personal life. Harvard and Yale's uh, goals were unmistakably clear. Academic excellence, Christian formation. But today they do something very different from their founding purpose, and we call this mission drift. 
And it's something that is true of every organization. And within the church, it's true of every congregation that we can be guilty of mission drift. That we take our eye off the prize. The reason for which we exist is not for ourselves and for each other, but it's for the world. It's what Jesus calls us to when he calls us to be a witness in our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and yes, to the ends of the earth. And this is the a place where Jesus isn't known in other cultures. And our text today would call us as we embrace that particular invitation of Jesus to be a witness in our world, to embrace that with this truth that first of all, this is a witness to a gracious truth. And secondly, that it's a witness to global tribes. Again, if you haven't been with us, we've seen how Jesus in John chapter three and four actually lived out the witness in these four different places uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, and how the book of Acts is structured around this particular uh, kind of construct. As the Gospel, uh, Luke reports, starts in Jerusalem, moves to Judea and Samaria, and then out to the ends of the earth. And, and what's the message that the church has? Well, it's a witness to a gracious truth. And, and Paul says it very succinctly at the beginning of chapter 8 of the book of Romans. He says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you and I know that what that's all about is what we confessed this, mo this morning. We're sinners. And we screw it up every single day. We screw it up in our relationships with each other. We screw it up in our relationships with this world. And, and, and we need something to set it right again. And we know that we can't go back and, and have any redos in life. It doesn't work that way. What's done is done, and so the only way to get rid of what's done is done is to erase it, to blot it out, as uh, the Bible says, to blot out our transgressions. But you need a pretty strong eraser in order to do that work, and that eraser was nothing less than the life and death of God's one and only Son, the Son who came for the world. And this is what Paul celebrates in this text, and he's been celebrating all the way through the first part of uh, the book of Romans. You remember that in just the previous chapter, this is where he's going through this internal struggle. He says, the good things I want to do, I don't find myself doing. The bad things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Oh, wretched man, who can save me from this body of death? And then he said, thanks be to God, who gives us the victory in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because the good news is that when you and I hear those words, your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is because of what God has done. What the law is incapable of doing in your and my life, and that is making us holy and pure, Jesus does by the precious gift of his love and grace, by taking on flesh for you and for me. It's what we celebrated at the beginning of this season, the coming of Christ into this world, as John says, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. And he did it by putting on flesh and blood and walking up Calvary's hill in my place and your place. So that you and I can be absolutely and confidently sure that sins are forgiven, that God has adopted us into his family, and that he continues to walk with us each and every day in life. And, and that's what he calls us to share now with our world, to share with uh, what in the Bible is called the ethne, the ethne or ethnos. It's, uh, when, when the Bible uses the word nation, it often has this word behind it. And, and this word means not just a politi geopolitical uh, a boundary uh, kind of nation, like the United States of America, or Pakistan, or Uganda, or India, but it means every single people group in it. It's the word 
that is at the foundation of our word ethnic. And, and God had envisioned that his house would be a place for all nations. One of the places in the Old Testament, the book of prophet Isaiah, where he uses this word is when he's talking about his temple. And he says, my temple is not just for the people who are physical descendants of Abraham, but there to be, it's to be a place where all people from every people group can come to share in the grace, the knowledge that because of Christ Jesus, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and this is the good news that Jesus says, uh, both in Mark, as we read it, and then here in Matthew, um, uh, Matthew's record of the same words during Holy Week, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all, again, ethnic nations, and then the end will come. And it's this same word that Jesus uses in the Great Commission when he says, go and make disciples of all nations. And Jesus did that by his life, death, and resurrection. The, it can be used of a people group for certain, uh, especially the Jewish people group. Uh, you might remember that uh, Caiaphas, who was high priest uh, the year that Jesus died, had said uh, these words, you know nothing, nor do you consider that it's better for you that one man should die instead of the people so that the whole nation, this is the word ethne again. He's, he's not just talking, remember, they don't have a nation, is it? They're under Roman domination. What is he talking about? He's talking about all the Jewish literal sons of Abraham, whether they live in Judea or in Galilee in the north. That's the nation that he's talking about. And it's the same word that Jesus used when he was walking in along the road to Emmaus with the Emmaus disciples. And, and they, they say, well, we don't know what's going on. And so Jesus, it says, opens the scriptures. And he says, this is what is written, that the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all peoples, to all nations. Um, I came across something. I'm going to see if this works. First time I've ever done this, okay? So this is a video that explains all nations. So we'll see if we can get it started. It'll give you a good picture. What is a UPG? UPG stands for Unreached People Group. But to understand what that means, we need to first talk about people groups. When Jesus told his followers, go and make disciples of all nations, the Greek words he used were ta ethne, meaning all ethnic groups or people groups. So what is a people group? A people group is basically a group of individuals that have a common sense of history, language, beliefs, and identity. It is pretty much a group of people that considers us, us, and everyone else, them. While there are about 196 countries in the world today, there are over 16,000 distinct people groups. Let's look at Pakistan as an example. That is one nation going by our English word, but ethnically, Pakistan has over 400 distinct nations or people groups within its borders. Around 7,000 of those 16,000 total people groups are considered UPGs, or unreached people groups. A group is considered unreached if less than 2% of their population is evangelical Christian. That is, it has too few true believers to evangelize and disciple the rest of the people group. Almost 3 billion people fall into this category. Over 3,000 of those 7,000 unreached people groups are considered UUPGs, or unengaged unreached people groups. These people groups have no churches, no believers, no missionaries, and no one actively focused on engaging them. 95% of all unreached people groups are located in the part of the world between 10 degrees latitude and 40 degrees latitude, stretching from North Africa to Southeast Asia. We call this the 1040 window. It's in the 1040 window that most of the major non-Christian religions hold sway. Collectively, they are known as the Thumb people, tribal, Hindu, unreligious, including many Chinese, Muslim, and Buddhist. Jesus said that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached as a testimony to ta ethne, all people groups, and then the end would come. Less than 3% of our total cross-cultural missionary force is working with unreached people groups. 
we must go to the unreached. At the same time, it's estimated that over 350 unreached people groups are living in the United States today as immigrants, refugees, and international students. We must welcome the unreached. Christ commands us to make disciples of all nations. Jesus is alive. His mission for us is clear, yet the task stands incomplete. Together, we can change that. I thought that was a good summary of uh, what a people group is, what an unreached people group is, and then that third category where there aren't any Christians. Uh, this is a, a map of the uh, world uh, that shows you where the unreached people groups are. Um, that's the red ones. The formative or nominal church um, is yellow, which is why you've got most of Russia in here, and that would be the Russian Orthodox. Um, established or significant uh, Evangelical church presence is the green, the green. Um, and then there's a few places where there's not a lot of data available. You saw that it said that uh, the majority of unreached people groups are in the 1040 window. And uh, you can see it on that previous map. Uh, this is the 1040 window across Africa and Southern Asia. You might say, well, why is that? Well, here's a way to, to kind of process it a little bit. Um, oops. There we go. Uh, this is a map that has, by color of dar uh, the darkness of the blue, um, what percent of the population is cr considered Christian. And you'll notice that, uh, again, across that 1040 window, it's the, the least. Why? Because as you heard on the video, this is where a lot of the non-Christian religions primarily hold sway. And you might say, well, how come that hasn't changed in these 2,000 years? And, and the reason is, it's because um, it's very difficult to do evangelism work in many of these places. So here's another way to look at it. In, in this particular slide uh, or picture, you have depicted the number of countries that have official state religions. And if you'll notice that most of those, and that's the, the dark blue, most of those are in the 1040 window. What does that mean? That means very often in those countries, uh, Christian witnesses are not welcome. So uh, uh, in uh, our previous congregation, one of the sons of uh, our members was, uh, was serving in Indonesia, and he could not witness publicly about his faith with Jesus Christ. He was in a mission organization, but he went and um, they taught English as a second language, and he taught basketball because he was a good basketball coach. And if perhaps in conversation he was asked, well, then he could share his faith. But he dared not ever be an initiating conversations. He could not hand out Bibles or tracts or anything else like that. And, and that's one of the reasons why you heard uh, in the video that I'm talking about how about 350 different unreached people groups come to the United States either as uh, immigrants, refugees, or as college students. And, and it's why so often there's um, a wonderful opportunity to, to reach some of the unreached people groups by, by welcoming and by caring about those kinds of people. And, and I would just encourage you, if we ever have the opportunity again, to get past this COVID stuff. I know that sometimes uh, the international mission uh, outreach that uh, happened uh, uh, through uh, Luther Memorial in Shorewood, would sometimes look for homes for the international students to go to for, uh, for something like a, a, a Christmas or Thanksgiving kind of celebration because many of those young people, young men and women, have no place to go over the holidays. They, they're not going home, right? And sometimes the dorms even shut down, you know, except for uh, uh, those that they need to accommodate that way. But that's a time when very often we have an opportunity uh, to, to reach out and, and touch somebody in a very simple way um, and over uh, a relationship that can be built the gospel can travel. And, and sometimes we think, well, gee, you know, it's really, really tough. Um, uh, but I like this African proverb. If you think you're too small to make a difference, you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. <laughs> right? And, and so we just want to look for ways to continue to make a difference in whatever way. Uh, I, 
I'd encourage you to be alert to people in our community that might speak with an accent, because it tells you that they probably didn't grow up in and around here, and uh, they might be one of those groups. And, and one of the things uh, the council did at their last meeting is just to present with you with a couple of opportunities. So uh, your handouts, one is for Hope for Haiti, a place that Bill Chandler and Mark uh, Sider have done uh, uh, some mission trips in. Uh, and uh, the other one is about some places uh, been near and dear to my heart. I've been to Uganda four times. Jerry went with me this last summer uh, for the first time. And, and we have opportunities to assist uh, a part of the country that is very poor. Uh, they actually have an opportunity to reach unreached people groups because while uh, Uganda is a fairly Christian nation, they have a lot of refugees. They're one of the countries that will, rec uh, that will uh, welcome refugees from just about anywhere. And one of those places they get a lot of refugees from is from Sudan. Well, Sudan is one of those countries that you cannot witness in. But the refugees that come into Uganda get served by Christian organizations and loved and cared for. And, and uh, very often congregations are started in those refugee camps. And then when those people go back, they carry the love that they have come to know in Jesus with them. And it's a reminder today that um, that when we think about our participation in that, it's because we've got this gracious truth. That there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we want everybody to live in that confident, gracious truth each and every day of their lives. And when we reach out to the ends of the earth, as one author put it, uh, we're just preparing ourselves to be in heaven. Because in the book of Revelation it says this, I had a, a vision of a great multitude from every nation, race, people, and life tongue. They stood before the throne wearing their white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, crying, Salvation comes from our God, who is seated on the throne and from the Lamb. That's the wonderful invitation our Jesus gives us today. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And he opens our eyes and our hearts to respond in that way. And, and one of the ways we talked about that maybe somebody might be moved to respond to is to... Uh, to share a particular offering to one of those places or some of the other places that we uh, have supported and people we've, su we've supported. I saw in the most recent uh, Lutheran Bible Translator uh, 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 a piece, uh, uh, David Federitz, who has uh, been a member here a long time ago, for a short period of time when I was here as pastor the first time. Uh, he was while I was going to Concordia University, and he uh, continues to work with the people of Ghana. And, uh, and so we just got a lot of opportunities. So one of the ways that I've been thinking about this is this, you know, they're arguing in Congress about giving us more money. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't need that money. But I know there are a lot of other people who do. And so one of the things we do is look for who can we pay that money forward because God's blessing us in ways that we don't need that, you know, stimulus check. And our kids, thankfully, are all gainfully employed. Our family, they don't need that check is, uh, from us as well. Uh, but this is uh, sometimes then provides an opportunity, a source to be able to bless somebody else along the way. And uh, I just plant that seed in your own heart as we, uh, as we think about how we can be a blessing to the nations. Would you rise and let me pray about that? Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you that you accepted your Father's mission to be a witness in your Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we thank you that you, uh, because of your grace, help us to uh, live in the truth that our sins are fully and freely forgiven and that there is no condemnation for, for us who trust and walk with you. And we want that, that good news to get out, Jesus, and we thank you for the opportunity to be your hands and your feet uh, in your uh, mouth in this world, and, and that we're able to support others who can go where we can't go. So, Jesus, just uh, continue to lay that burden on our heart and help us to respond as we uh, are prompted by your Spirit. We commit our lives and our witness in your good and gracious hands uh, for your name's sake. Amen. Now may that peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds from faith in your Jesus, the life everlasting. Amen. Let's confess our faith together in the words of the uh, Apostles' Creed. We confess. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We join the psalmist in saying this day, May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will hear him. Please be seated as we join our offering. Continue to spread your reign through our witness involvement with ethnic 
groups and peoples in our world. Sow seeds of faith into many hearts as your disciples witness by word and deed in your name. Strengthen our missionaries throughout our world to call others to live by faith. Testify to your grace, especially Sean and Christian Trump in, in Kenya, the Lutheran Church in Uganda and in Congo, and our brothers and sisters in Christ in Haiti, Salam and Georgina and Yagri, and David and Valerie veterans as they serve the people of Ghana, and Ben Chandler as he serves uh, in Slovakia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord of the nations, fill the members of all of our households with a commitment to share the good news to the ends of the earth. Bless with daily strength Mandy, Brian, and Kobe Michael, uh, Nathan, and Brianna Gumber as they walk through a challenging time in their family life, giving peace and discernment. We join Karen Miller in thanksgiving for the gift of family and friends, especially the gift of parents who, like hers, uh, love their children, witness to your grace, and lead their children to know and trust in you. As John and Keisha Matthews and Gianna Smith Calloway go through a special event this Tuesday, we ask that you give success to their efforts. And as Chris, Jenny, Violet, and Lily Deedy step into this new year, grant them continued help, family help, professional success, and a favorable housing market as they anticipate a move this year. Allow our witness to your grace to shine throughout the world, along with Chad and Miriam, Emily and James Mitchell. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, now remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus sends us into mission with these words, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, O oh, my disciples of all nations, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. In the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor, turn his face towards you, and give you peace. Amen. Amen.